Just a heads up, this video is going to casually drop a lot of spoilers for not only The Last of Us Part 2, but the original The Last of Us game. Consider yourself warned. I wasn't exactly rolling around on the floor with The Last of Us, ripping at its clothes or anything. The game felt like Oscar bait in that a lot of the choices with the story, world, and gameplay all felt like they were chosen not because someone had a unique and interesting story to tell, but because those choices would lead to a game that would garner widespread appeal. But there is a distinction between doing something new and doing something well, and I'll admit more often than not, The Last of Us does things well, or at least well enough. Resources are just scarce enough to feel meaningful, but you'll only be caught short-handed if you play poorly, and an emphasis on melee combat means you're never truly out of options. And the levels are well-designed, and the story well-directed. I know that, because when I replayed the game, I could remember basically every story beat and level layout point for point, which is an emblem of solid, memorable design. Gameplay is best described as that kind of game in which you start the encounter, get some stealth kills, then get found out and shoot the rest of the enemies, but with the stealth section much more prolonged than in games like Uncharted. It's not agonizingly bad, it's just a bit of been there done similar, you know? And it gets a bit tiresome with how overlong the game is and how uncomplicated the gameplay remains throughout. Plus, I hated how you had to buy an ability to stop your aim from wobbling like your gun barrel is tied to a candy floss machine. Overall, a pretty harmless game, but in a way, I think that was my main problem. Don't get me wrong, The Last of Us is still a bleak game, and its story isn't bad by any stretch, but it doesn't make any deep cuts, you know, and doesn't really show us any strain of post-apocalypse we're unfamiliar with. Bandit factions? Yep. Militarized zones? Natch. Zombies we don't call zombies? Right this way. Cannibals? Of course. Who else will bring the snack? The thing is, as much as The Last of Us tries to make a point, or at least I assume it does, about the role of hope in humanity, the game's world and enemies feel rather dehumanized. The attitude for the game seems to be that the post-apocalypse will pretty much turn people into mindless killers unless they're one of the good guys. All of the good survivors have or have had someone they cared about, which makes up the story's core theme about fighting for love, but not a single one of the hundreds of bandits and soldiers we slaughter warrant even a moment's pause. They just suck, dude, and them sucking doesn't really fit in any broader points. There's no middle ground, the story just isn't actually all that complex or truly provocative, and honestly I felt like the ending suffered a lot and trying to make a point the rest of the game really wasn't propping up, an ending about the value of life. Yeah, it kinda loses something after killing enough bandits to populate the Upper East Side, you know? I wouldn't say the ending lost me, but it just felt like having your cake and smashing it with a modified 2x4 too. I think it says something that the game isn't broadly considered a survival horror title despite its survival horror gameplay tropes, how superficial the game truly is and how it feels like an amalgamation of concepts rather than any more engaged mix. So as you can probably guess, I was pretty apathetic about The Last of Us Part 2 coming out. Honestly, I wasn't even sure I was going to get the game at all, but then something in particular caught my attention. A big deal was being made about how the game was adding dogs as a new enemy type, and how difficult and morally challenging it would be to have to kill them. Sites were posting articles, promotional emails sent out drew attention to the dogs, even IGN's review of the game has a little sidebar, you better watch out dog owners. This might seem like a petty thing to get caught up on, but to me there's something incredibly pretentious about it. How long have we been killing dogs in video games? Dog enemies in themselves are a deeply ingrained gaming trope, and now that the dog enemies have names, it's some brave new stride we've never seen before. Look at me in Resident Evil 3. I'll name this dog Steven. And now Steven is dead. If a dog is attacking me in a video game, I have no qualms with killing it, it's just a game. Killing the dog attacking you is part of wind condition logic, not real life emotion. But these dogs are so much better than those other guys, even though they act the same way as the others. Is this really the new apex of tough moral decisions you thought up, you hack game? That's when I knew I just had to play through the hack game, just to see the kind of mess that was no doubt lurking behind an exterior of incredible smugness. And you know, I had to kill every dog in the game. Call it petty, I don't care. Professionals have standards. Just know that it somehow proves my point I think I'm making. You're eating your bonios in hell tonight, Fido. At first I thought this one was gonna get away from me, but then the game's like, chill fam, we got him. This one, yeah, I'm still trying to find ways to sequence break and get this one. You win this round, Druckmann, I guess, I don't know. But between all the virtual dog murder was a lot of video game, so I might as well talk about what I played, cause, oof, is that a video game indeed? A very, very, very long video game. A video game with moments, but just ultimately feels like a shallow attempt at keeping a brand name alive. I'm gonna remind everyone now that I'll be dealing with some heavy spoilers while I talk about and analyze the story, so I can better dig into what it is exactly that does and does not work for the game. So if you stuck around past the opening warning, here's your last chance to avoid my noise about that. Hope to see you back when you're done with the game. For the people who are still here, without further ado, let's get into it. 
The Last of Us Part 2 has one of the most awkwardly told stories I've witnessed in a long time. It's seriously baffling how much of a mess of pacing and chronology the game is. The easiest way to put it is by saying it's a story told with its events out of order, constantly bending backwards on itself to explain what's already been shown. The storytelling feels confused, like it has no idea when to show you the things it wants to show you, resulting in a game with zero narrative momentum, constantly undercutting its attempts at emotion and filling space with useless or redundant scenes. The original Last of Us was a tad over long, but it made up for it with confidence. It was always showing you what it wanted to show you, when it wanted to show you it. The Last of Us Part 2 lacks that sense of control. From the very beginning of the game, something about the pacing feels off. Think back to the iconic introduction of The Last of Us 1. After slowly establishing a charming and believable father-daughter relationship, the tension slowly builds as a feeling of something being wrong builds and builds, and we come to understand the scope of the disaster taking place until we're right in the thick of it, watching the world go to hell, a complete breakdown of the world we thought we understood. Then the game hits you with that real gut punch, the tragic death of Joel's daughter. Sarah. Baby! Don't do this to me, baby. Don't do this to me, baby. Come on. <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just gonna end the clip right now. It takes a lot to get me, but this scene gets me every time. I liked Troy Baker before this scene, but holy hell, his performance here is what solidified him, to me, as a legendary actor. This opening is so potent and emotionally raw in all less than 20 minutes. I may not agree with you every step of the way, The Last of Us, but even I can agree that this opening segment is absolutely legendary, one of the finest in gaming. And Troy, you've earned yourself a one-time, one-use, peck-on-the-cheek gift certificate from good old Scotty J. You know, after the pandemic and whatnot. The introductory portion of The Last of Us Part 2 takes no less than two hours, and believe me, it's not gonna make you want to kiss anyone. Which is ironic, because, well... Seriously though, Part 2's introduction is just a sloppy mess, even without comparing it to the original game. So, you start up the game, and it's like a previously on The Last of Us, reminding you of the first game's climax, presumably a short while after that game rolled credits. After a brief follow the guy on horseback hold up to continue sequence, we get back to Jackson, the community Joel and Ellie settled into at the end of the first game. After a stupid guitar minigame unlocks the second half of a cutscene, the action then jumps ahead four years. We walk around Jackson, do it some more. Seth gives us apology steak sandwiches. Walk. Snowball fight to tutorialize basic movement. More walking. Switch to a new character. More movement tutorials. More walking. Fight zombies. Sneak zombies. More sneak. Back to Ellie. More horse stuff. More walking up to button prompts, more horse stuff and exploration, more zombies, lots of zombies, climb the truck, more zombies, open up the drawers, lots of zombies, wait for rope, horse riding, walking around, watch Ellie and Dina smoke weed and back to the new character and walking, and then a whole lot of zombies and Joel and Tommy are there. You think I'm pulling your leg? You think I'm drawing this out for comedy? Honey, I'm sparing you the details here. I wasn't joking when I said this bit takes two whole hours. This opening is so meandering and so awkwardly strung along, taking ages to establish anything of substance to suggest an overarching plot, and giving nothing to pull you in during that entire time. See, I thought the snowball fight was a really cute tutorial, a cheeky juxtaposition of using the mechanics we'll later be using for much more brutal purposes, with the endearing nature of the little community lifestyle Ellie has adopted. Then we get basically the same tutorial with the new character, and then a repeat one more time back on Ellie. And wowee, is there plenty of hold the left stick up to continue non-gameplay filling out the rest of the space. You can argue that this is intentional design compared to the first game's opening. In contrast to that game's hell on earth urgency, over the past four years, Joel and Ellie have become more comfortable, more about routine and taking it easy, so the introduction is slower to mimic that. And I guess the mysterious character switch is supposed to be what hooks you, but no matter how you slice it, while walking forward for 20 minutes with a strong narrative of hook is forgivable, walking forward for two hours with no sense of how the narrative is panning out is a slog. Also, a veritable sea of fungus zombies isn't doing much for your lax attitude, bro. Not off to a great start.
Things finally pick up when the mysterious new character, named Abby, advises Joel and Tommy to come back to her gang's hideout to weather out the zombies in the storm, which they accept. They get there, meet the gang, even inviting them down after the storm to restock before they head out. Everything's going pleasantly until the new character shotguns Joel's leg nearly all the way off. Wait, that's not medicine, that's a golf club, how's that gonna help? Oh. Ellie rushes to the scene, only to get beaten up and held down by the rest of the mob, helpless to do anything but watch as Abby brings down the golf club one last time. Yep, the first major event of The Last of Us Part Two is Joel being bludgeoned to death. This death of Joel is still something I'm trying to wrap my head around. I keep trying to view it from all these different angles, but no matter how I come about it, it just doesn't seem to have the narrative merit the game thinks it does. At the onset of the original Last of Us, Joel is a bitter, weary fellow. His daughter is long dead, he trusts basically no one, and as a smuggler in a broken world, he has basically lost all moral reservations with taking lives. He just lives day by day for the meager supplies he earns and nothing more. He's a hardened survivalist, and after the devastating introduction, it makes perfect sense how he got there. While at first he regards Ellie as little more than a chore to take care of, the more time he spends with her, the more the two open up to one another, and the more Joel sees his hardened exterior peeled away, until he cares for Ellie like a surrogate daughter. By the end of the game, Joel is reunited with a sense of purpose and love that he lost 20 years ago. That quite naturally leads to his decision at the end of the game to choose to save Ellie's life, rather than have her be sacrificed to create a possible vaccine. His character arc directly informs the thesis of the game's narrative, a testament to the strength of a parent's love, that love stronger than the world itself. Moving into The Last of Us Part 2, after making a choice to save his surrogate child over the world, Joel just... dies. Is this Joel's punishment? Is this the game telling us that Joel made the wrong choice? I guess the problem there is, at least to me, Joel's choice was 100% correct. Well, okay, not 100% correct. Probably could have not killed so many people. Look, going against the Fireflies, that's the correct part, alright? This is one of the big sticking points I had with The Last of Us' story, in that letting the Fireflies kill Ellie made no sense. Since Ellie is immune to the infection, the Fireflies want to harvest the specimen surrounding her brain. Once they remove it, they'll be able to reverse engineer a vaccine. First off, vaccines are for viral infections, not fungal. Second, wouldn't it make sense to study Ellie instead of the specimen? It's not like she was infected by a mutated benign strain. Shouldn't you be looking at her immune response to the fungus before you cut it out? It's not like you got spares. Third, and perhaps the most depressingly pragmatic point I have, what good do they think they're going to do? A vaccine is going to magically rebuild the world? Gonna take a guess and say the infected are beyond saving, what with the cauliflower heads they got going on? And they can still kill immune people by, you know, tearing out their throats. But regardless if it's meant to cure or kill infected or just keep non-fungal people from being turned from, like, spores and all that, how much are you gonna be able to make? Can you share with the whole class? Can you conceivably spread it around the country or around the world? See, I just don't think that this plan to kill Ellie for a vaccine is all that watertight. But even beyond thinking about things logically, Joel's choice forms the backbone of the original The Last of Us story. It's the right choice because a parent choosing their child over the world gives the story its purpose for being told. Joel's fate in The Last of Us Part 2 doesn't seem to regard his arc or the original game's story at all, and I think that's what makes the moment feel like a betrayal. Tons of character development down the drain, so much potential for interplay between him and Ellie, gone. For what? Shock value? In this game, Joel's just reduced to a prop, a means to get Ellie angry. This sucks because in The Last of Us, neither Joel nor Ellie felt disposable. Both characters were super dimensional and engaging in their own rights, and they both grew and evolved because of one another. One didn't serve solely to flesh out the other. So for one of these characters to just be violently murdered apropos of nothing, it just feels wrong. It feels like it misses the point. It just feels like hate for the sake of hate. I guess you can argue that the story of The Last of Us Part 2 is taking a different approach, so it's not right to view it through the lens of the original narrative. The Last of Us Part 2 isn't a story about love, it's a story about the cycle of revenge and violence, with the only way to break the cycle being to just stop. So to think about Joel in an old context isn't doing this new game justice. The thing is, this game calls itself The Last of Us Part 2, which seems like a very intentional choice intimating that this is the second piece of the narrative begun by the first game. So I think it's absolutely justified to be disappointed with how carelessly the character of Joel is treated here. Like, I know it's been around four years of relatively easy living, so maybe he didn't think much of a group of traveling armed strangers, but they're still conducting patrols around the town. And weren't there bandits near Jackson in the original game? Raided the power plant? Are those gone? 
No more bandits? I know a horde of fungus zombies can bring together unlikely bedfellows, but hearing Joel take so kindly to these well-armed strangers, more or less agreeing that, sure, let's bring them into our highly populated town, lapse in character doesn't quite do it justice. And it definitely doesn't feel like part two concludes Joel's story in any meaningful way unto itself. I've heard it online that the game has been compared to Schindler's List, but honestly the movie that came to my mind was Nightmare on Elm Street 4 The Dream Master, a film that also brought back beloved characters from the previous story, only to kill them in the first 10 minutes as an attempt at shock value. That's right, this game's plot writing is on the level of Nightmare on Elm Street 4. Seven years after the first game, this is what we got. Alright, so after we walk around a bit more, because of course we do, the plot finally gets going. Seeking revenge for Joel's death and following the path of an equally vengeful brother Tommy, Ellie and her girlfriend Dina head after the group, known as the Washington Liberation Front, or Wolves more pithily, to their home base in Seattle where- Oh, we're already there? Okay. Yeah, no odyssey across the nation like in the first game. A little surprising at first, but I'm not gonna start complaining about this game getting to the point. The next several hours of gameplay are spent wandering around Seattle, looking for leads on where the wolves are posted up, and one of the first missions is that old chestnut of padding out video games in that we immediately find a door to where we're trying to go and have to spend an hour or two looking around for a means to open it. Can't say the game doesn't start how it means to go on! One of the weirder things about The Last of Us Part II is how the first actual area in the game is also the largest and the most explorative. The original The Last of Us was a quasi-linear experience, in that you had one specific point to reach to progress the story, but the environments were large enough that finding that way wasn't immediately obvious and left lots of space for organic exploration. The Last of Us Part II is designed the same way, but the first proper area in the game, downtown Seattle, takes this to a level bordering on open world. Your objective is to find gasoline, which can be found in one of two buildings, which you have to locate by just exploring the city. On the way, there are plenty of other buildings you're free to scavenge through. Am I weird for thinking this is weird? Starting the game off with easily the largest explorable location in the game? You learn a tutorial for using a map before learning how to craft stun bombs, and I'll give you a guess which one of those mechanics is used beyond the downtown level. It seems like an odd way to start the game with what is arguably an over-exaggeration of what's to come, another quirk in the general pacing of the game. But I guess it does make sense to put it here rather than after the drama and tension ramp up and things start feeling urgent. Not like a game like God of War 2018 that just asks if you want to stop possibly world-altering events to go check out the local beaches and fart around for an hour. The Last of Us Part 2 even does the same thing as God of War 2018 where your companion goes, So we can continue on with the story, or we can explore a bit, what do you say? PlayStation exclusives, man, such an incestuous bunch. And after the opening hours of the game being full of slowly walking after your companion character and rigidly following on-screen directions, I won't be complaining about my leash being unfastened for a bit. It's nice. But take my word for it, you're not missing much if you opt to skip out. Just some collectibles that don't affect gameplay beyond 100% completion, and a few extra lines of trademark Naughty Dog snark between the characters. Trust me, you're not going to be shorthanded by skipping out on some resource scavenging. You'll be able to get by well enough with what they put on the required path, as well as the frequent and obvious alcoves just to the side of the required path that will, more often than not, restock you more than well enough. It is still linear, and it can't have the player waddling into conflict shorthanded because they didn't pillage the local Starbucks for supplements. But whenever you do decide to wander back to the story path, get ready for some teen drama, because it turns out that Dina is pregnant, whoa, and the baby is Jesse's. This guy from the opening. If only he were here right now to- Yo, what the heck, he is here? Middle of occupied territory, how the- How did you manage that guy? And then after that, there's a hospital level, and we kill a lady, and then we go to the aquarium and kill more people. If it sounds like I'm shortchanging the plot and what is a portion of the game that will take between 6 and 10 hours to complete, I'm really not. The Last of Us Part 2 has just adorable little quirk to its storytelling, in that it'll make you go through an entire one and a half to two hour mission before getting to the half minute that moves the plot forward, leaving a lot of empty space in between. Also it leaves you wondering if the missions needed to go on so long. This part of the game is definitely more about the characters than the plot, which wouldn't be all bad, if the characters were better, we spend the most time with Ellie's girlfriend, Dina, since we're with her since the very start of the journey. I don't really have anything bad to say about her, honestly. She's fine. No reason to dislike her. She doesn't really feel deep, though. Felt like I didn't learn anything about her in the 10th hour with her that I didn't know from being with her for one. And her dialogue and chemistry with Ellie is pretty tepid, just a mite basic. They don't really have much differentiating them, personality-wise, so it just feels a little lukewarm. Not bad, just kinda dull. But Jesse, this guy, 
is an absolute nothing character. I struggle to think of even one word to describe Jesse other than Ellie's friend. I guess that's two words. I guess I proved myself wrong. He just shows up every now and then, talking like he's doing something, and then just fades away into the background. Eventually he gets shot in the face, spoiler alert, and the people around him don't even yell, Jesse, no! This goes to show how little he contributed to anything. It is my genuine belief that Jesse was only added to the story when the writers realized they needed someone with a different anatomy to help make a baby subplot possible. And I gotta say, this new Ellie was missing something, at least for me. Ellie in The Last of Us was arguably the star of the show, a kid full of wonder for the world, slowly and tragically losing that wonder, with bleak reality repeatedly stepping into the picture. She was excitable, she was interesting to watch, so much more than the Ellie we got in part two. I get that time has passed, her childlike aspects have been tempered by time and grit, but I never felt like this Ellie was a maturation of the old Ellie, more like a paring down or spinoff or something. I never felt like I was seeing some deep exploration of her character, or that we were getting some sort of character study. All this Ellie wants to do is kill people, and to remind us that that's what she wants to do. I didn't feel like she had any interiority for us to see into, no deeper shades than the blood and dirt on the surface level. Joel did what he did to protect his surrogate daughter, Ellie does what she does out of hate, going out of her way to hurt people, and she just lacks her depth of character and engaging arc from the original game. She's kind of fallen into the reboot Tomb Raider notion that brutality and brutalization make an interesting character, and acts as further proof that you need to dig deeper than that to score. You can't have her throw a brick and call that her character arc. I should mention that this length of story is also broken up by a handful of flashbacks detailing the years in between the end of the first game and the beginning of the second. These flashbacks a series of moments shared between Ellie and Joel. The first takes place three years before the main plot, in which Joel takes Ellie to an old museum for her birthday. It's a level that's just entirely walking around, not much you actually do, and it's really long, but I actually think the narrative aspect of the sequence is one of the game's highlights, at least for me. There's just something so genuine about it, and given how Ellie has always had this fascination with the pre-fungus world, it seems like a really natural extension of both her and Joel's characters to see them here. I've torn into a lot already, but even I can't help but smile here. The acting chops on Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson are still the crowning jewels of this series. Overall, it's a nice bright spot and otherwise gloomy title, though, you know, undercutting itself just a bit by reminding us that Joel was killed about five hours ago. The second flashback is from a year after the previous in which Joel and Ellie, seemingly more estranged than last we saw them, attempt to go on a little bonding errand that turns into clearing out a hotel full of infected. This mission's pretty nice too, though not as cheery as the first, obviously. I'll admit, I got a little bit of a tickle playing alongside Joel again, the roles being reversed here. Classic The Last of Us sneaking around, this time with Ellie in the top billing spot. Classic changing of the guard stuff. At the end of the level, we learn the reason for the growing distance between Joel and Ellie is that Ellie is starting to doubt Joel's story that there are more people like her immune to the cordyceps strain, and that there is no cure. Ellie feels like her sense of purpose in life has been betrayed, but Joel reaffirms his story. But it's clear Ellie's not fully convinced. That much becomes evident in the final flashback, which is also the shortest of the three, which sees Ellie traveling back to the Firefly Hospital, the site of the first game's bloody finale. This one doesn't have a full level attached to it like the others, but it does start with a bit of gameplay, in which you walk down a hallway, basically a straight shot to the operating room, then interact with one thing, and then it's back to cutscene. Yeah, uh, not sure why that needed to be playable, honestly. Could've just made it one long scene. But it's in this final flashback, the truth is finally revealed to Ellie. Making a vaccine. Would have killed you. So I stopped them. Ellie doesn't take this news well and wants nothing to do with Joel, thus explaining their estrangement at the beginning of the game. Something about this flashback feels weird to me, maybe because of how short it is. The truth, this revelation hid from Ellie was probably the biggest question posed by the sequel when carrying over from the previous game. Would Ellie find out? Would Joel tell her? Ooh, what's gonna happen? Maybe it's how brief the scene is in the face of that level of importance? Or maybe it's because this revelation feels like an explanation for previous events in a self-contained story rather than anything earth-shattering on its own. And you know, Joel tragically died about six hours ago. I think the emotion of the moment is neutered somewhat when it doesn't really feel like we're there for it, just being told how it happened a while ago, and it honestly feels like this moment was used more as a tool for setting up prior drama than anything greater. More than a little disappointing to see the reveal implemented this way. That being said, I think the flashbacks in this part of the game are my favorite bits of it. It just feels like classic sequel stuff, you know, and a nice reminder of when the characters in this series had more life to them. Well, figuratively. And 
also literally. There is one part later in the main plot that almost got interesting, though. From her first proper victim off the hit list, Ellie finally gets a solid lead on the location of Abby, the dirty girl who did the dirty deed of killing Joel. Partway there, however, some wolves hear on the radio about some sniper at the marina, who is pretty obviously Tommy. Jesse wants to go to the marina to save Tommy, but Ellie wants to stay the course and find Abby, giving some rather half-assed excuses for doing so. So the two split up, Jesse going to help Tommy and Ellie going after Abby alone. Well, thought I, alright, some true colors being shown, revenge maybe clouding Ellie's mind a bit too much, putting those she cares about at risk, alright, interesting. But then Ellie gets to the aquarium where Abby's supposed to be, and then Jesse and Tommy just show up perfectly fine. Oh, guess Ellie made the right choice then? Eh, doesn't seem like she's very happy about it though. Maybe it's because she realizes all her character has been sandpapered down. At this point in the story, all the characters present are wearying of chasing geese and also worrying about Dina's health as the pregnancy progresses. A decision is made to take what little victory they have in killing most of the murder group and heading on back down to Jackson. And though she seems the most reluctant of the group to leave, even Ellie agrees it's probably the best move. But right as the plans are made, someone breaks into the theater they've been hiding out in, and Ellie rushes out to find none other than Abby, materialized out of the ether and mad as hell. Jesse dies! Shame, and Ellie and Abby are finally face to face. Tensions run high. Jesse's dead. Tommy has a gun to his head. No one's sure what's going to happen. The climax is coming. But then all of a sudden, the scene stops. Then the game flashes back a few days, and suddenly you're playing as Abby instead, over the same timetable as Ellie, basically stopping the scene to say, This is how Abby got here. It's that abrupt. Like. <laughs> What even is pacing? You get to a climactic moment in Ellie's story and you just turn around and talk about something else? This is being in the car for eight hours and finally seeing the off-ramp for Disneyland when Daddy Druckmann slams on the brakes and says, we're gonna turn around and do the drive all over again, but this time the neighbors are gonna drive you. It's not even like a television cliffhanger in which it's all, ooh, come back next episode, because at least the next episode carries the momentum. The switch to Abby outright feels like the game's stopping near the end of one story and starting a completely new one, and it grinds what admittedly little momentum the game has to a halt. If the two plots were better interwoven, perhaps I could forgive it, but it's so abrupt and transitions so clumsily, it just feels like the game is screwing with you in the worst possible way. This next act of the game feels like it's prequelizing the act that came before, exploring all the characters from the Joel murder mob that Ellie systematically tracks down and kills. Like, the first thing you do after the switch is very slowly walk around a huge football stadium, talking to a bunch of characters we've already killed back in Ellie's story. With the way it's presented and how this leg of the narrative is portrayed, I'm just unclear of what to take away from it. Do you really need to spell out the hopes and dreams of all these characters I already killed for any reason other than making me feel like a bad person? Characters you killed, I should say, since I had no choice in the matter? Making me depressed isn't making your story deep. Making Ellie out to be the bad guy doesn't subvert anything when it's been clear from the very beginning that she's been doing bad things. Everyone here is a bad guy. It's such a sudden change of gears for the game to spin on its heels and ask you nine hours into the game to invest in a largely unfamiliar cast, especially when one of the characters is Abby. It's practically impossible to sympathize with Abby after watching her very violently beat Joel to death as the first major event in the game after Joel was nothing but helpful to her. And we're supposed to just roll with it? It's easily the most awkwardly handled narrative beat in the entire game, and trust me, that's saying something with this game. Abby's act just feels like a slump from beginning to end. I made a passing comment about how Ellie's story was full of teen drama, but there's no way around it with Abby's story. It's mostly just teen drama. Straight up, I don't like you hanging out with your ex, I still have feelings for you, type stuff. And it feels so at odds with so much of the story. Like these characters don't at all feel like aspects of the world. The original Last of Us introduced us to the likes of cynical but savvy survivalist Bill, who basically controlled an entire city of infected all on his own. Sassy smuggler Tess, who was at your side, but you never knew what she had going on under the surface. Henry, an older brother fighting to balance being a caring sibling while also living by strict caution, as dictated by survival. Meanwhile, the characters in Abby's campaign are all like, you and Mel, who is eight months pregnant, don't seem to be getting along well, so I thought we should bring this eight months pregnant medic, who's not a fighter but a medic, to ride along on our drive to the front lines when we are basically at war with a death cult that loves to slit open people's stomachs. And I don't care that this was an ambush, that they weren't expecting to get bushwhacked by cultists or whatever, or that she doesn't want to sit around or whatever. This woman should not be going anywhere. The bun is halfway out of the oven! This isn't friendship, this is stupidity! Real friends would 
tell you to sit down. These characters feel so empty. Naughty Dog is adept at snappy dialogue, always has been, but here that snappy dialogue feels like a mask to hide how shallow these characters are. The only character in Abby's friend circle that has any sort of second dimension to them is Owen, because at least he thinks back to killing Joel with some regret, as well as all the other violence he partakes in. He just doesn't blindly follow orders, killing who he's told, he thinks about it. He seems to care more than that, really values life and living. Doesn't make him a good character though! In fact, he's probably the most unlikable in the game. This is a guy who knocks up his girlfriend, then decides he'd rather abandon the girlfriend and the baby to travel all the way down the coast to California after hearing a rumor that there's a Firefly reunion tour happening, because he and Abby were both Fireflies and he wants her, his ex-girlfriend, to come sail away with him. He decides this, mind, when the girlfriend is eight months pregnant. Are we supposed to be rooting for him? What a piece of trash. Am I supposed to be sorry for killing him three hours ago? The girlfriend Mel isn't exactly a powder keg personality, a character whose only traits are her pregnancy and not liking Abby much. You're right there with you. She's the one I ended up sympathizing with the most. She pulls Abby aside late in the plotline and tells her that she's a bad person. I haven't always done the right thing. You're a piece of shit, Abby. And I'm here like, she's right, she does suck. All of these characters are bad people. Except for Manny. What a nice guy Manny is, being all nice. His dad's sick too, that's sad. It'd be really sad if Manny was gonna die. Wouldn't want to see that guy's brain matter sprayed five feet in front of his head, I'll tell you that much. Yeah, man, he's just here to die like Jesse and Ellie's story. We get a handful of flashbacks in this part of the game too, though obviously with Abby instead of Ellie, mostly fleshing out the relationship between Owen and Abby as they transition from being Fireflies to the Washington Liberation Front. I'm not gonna go into detail with them because there's not much to say. It's all young lovers stuff like jumping in water, calling each other idiots. They find an aquarium and Owen decides to live in it. Can he do that? Is this allowed? What really makes these flashbacks strange though is that they always have this lurch at the very end. Teen drama abruptly cut off by saying stuff like, I got a lead on where Joel is. I want to go kill Joel. That kind of thing. Again, it just emphasizes how at odds so much of this relationship drama is with the bleak overarching narrative. Yeah, it just feels wrong every time. And like the Ellie flashbacks, it only seems to flesh out past events that don't really need fleshing, and it honestly can feel more like time is being wasted more than utilized to any greater effect than trying to make me sorry about having already killed most of these people. People who have played the game, though, are probably wagging their fingers at their screens right now. Cause not all the Abby flashbacks are with Owen. No, the very first one, Owen's there, but it's all about Abby's dad. And here we learn why exactly Abby killed Joel. In the first game, the doctor performing the surgery on Ellie that would end her life, the doctor Joel stabbed in the neck with a scalpel, that doctor was Abby's dad, and now she's after Joel for revenge. You killed my father, prepare to be golf clubbed. There's something really insincere about the whole Abby's dad thing. I get that fatherhood's a theme of the story, but I don't know, just something feels wrong about it. Maybe it stems from how it's just, you know, the one guy in the face of like, an entire hospital full of people Joel killed? This guy? Oh no, she didn't have killed him. It trivializes Joel's actions, if you ask me. Actions that the previous game established as damning the whole world. But now this game's like, this one guy, that's the problem, she didn't have killed that one guy. If the entire murder mob had lost people to Joel, I think I'd understand better. But the only people that were Fireflies and were there at the hospital were Abby and Owen. And Abby seems like the only one that's angry. I guess if you look at it from Abby's perspective, there's some madman with a violent streak that slaughtered a bunch of innocents and deserves to be brought to justice. Sense enough to go after him, and hey, David more or less posited the same perspective in the original game. Only a few came back. They said that the others had been uh, slaughtered by a crazy man. <laughs> and get this, he's a crazy man traveling a little girl. But The Last of Us never asked you to sympathize with David, and to ignore one and a half games very pointedly in Joel and Ellie's perspective and the messages that first story crafted isn't exactly masterpiece storytelling. It's a lot of effort gone into no payoff, especially when you lead with your character violently clubbing an old man to death. Even with the murder of Joel aside, Abby's just a straight up unlikable unengaging character. I'd list personality traits of hers, but I honestly can't think of any. She feels like an angry blank slate that just does whatever without introspection, with a barely believable and paper-thin development arc tacked onto her. But we'll get to that. Because it just occurred to me that I've been tearing apart Abby's part of the game and I haven't even told you what happens. Why don't I do that now?
The WLF is at war with a death cult called the Seraphites. They were at peace, but now they're not, figures. After that well-thought-out ride to the front line goes south, Abby meets with the leader, or at least one of the leaders, I don't know, of the WLF called Isaac, who reluctantly reveals to her that Owen killed a mutual friend of theirs, Danny, when Owen refused to kill an old, defenseless Seraphite. Against Isaac's wishes, Abby goes to the aquarium to bring Owen out of hiding. On the way, however, she gets waylaid by Seraphites, who try to hang her and spill her guts. Thankfully, they brought her to the spot they're using to punish heretic Yara by smashing her arm with a hammer so Yara's little brother Lev can save the both of them. Abby helps the two young runaways escape the big ol' horde of fungus zombies that rolls up and leaves the siblings in a trailer park. She goes to Owen so we can tell her about all his plan to leave for Santa Barbara and so they can have relations out of wedlock. But Abby has a nightmare that the two Seraphite kids got caught, so she heads back to get them out of the trailer park. Yara's shattered arm has gotten worse, so Abby brings her back to the aquarium. Mel's there and needs supplies to amputate the arm, but those supplies are all the way back at the hospital. Lev says there's a way to get there much faster than the day's hike it would otherwise require by using certain Seraphite structures. So, you know, off they go. That gives Lev and Abby a long time to walk around, kill cultists, and talk about their feelings. I guess to the game's credit, it, they do say this way to the hospital will take about two hours, which it actually does. Only they said one hour, am I right? So after a whole two hours of walking and violence, with the only tangible plot point being that Lev and Yara are on the run because Lev is transgender, or at least identifies as male, which the cult doesn't like, we reach the hospital and oh lord, this chapter is still going. I just keep on stuffing, can't have enough stuffing! We gotta like mosey around some part of the hospital, turn on the power, go like to the basement that's super infected but uh, the infection's not spreading anymore. There's like an ugly amalgam monster you gotta fight. They sometimes run from it but then it just ends up being a boss fight. Look, I'm gonna skip ahead and tell you that we make it out alright and get the supplies back to Mel and chop chop the arm comes off. Surprised? Shouldn't be. Moving on. Owen wants to take the kids to Santa Barbara with him and Abby while still leaving the eight months pregnant girlfriend behind. So now she's not even losing to an ex. She's losing to two stray kids. What the heck, Owen? But Lev doesn't want to leave his mother behind, so steals a bow and hops back to Seraphite Island. Which wouldn't itself be a big problem if Isaac and the WLF weren't carrying out full-scale siege on the island. And it doesn't take long for the lush green fields to turn orange if you catch my smoking flaming drift. You know, believe it or not, I was actually kind of getting into this plot more than Ellie's by the end. It gives us some environments the likes of which we haven't quite seen yet. Yara and Lev are better characters than what we've gotten up to this point, and I could actually feel some of the tension escalating on the Seraphite Island, which was let down a bit by, you know, knowing for a fact Abby was going to survive. And Abby's act suffers from all the other problems of Ellie's, and in some ways even worse. There are a lot of conveniences all over the story, even more than in Ellie's. Good thing the two people who weren't 100% on the whole mean cult thing were literally delivered directly to Abby. Luckily, there was a pool right below the part of the scary Seraphite sky bridge we fell from. Stopped us from dying, it did. How convenient it is to randomly run into our good friend Manny so we could watch his brain blast out of his forehead from Tommy's sniper. Speaking of which, what the heck happens to Tommy? Does Jesse find him and scoop him out of the water or something? Because they're together and completely fine to catch up with Ellie. Um, probably washed up on a beach or something. This is all probably a side effect of the story being told in a more in-the-moment style compared to the original somewhat picaresque approach, which meant we were always seeing the right time in whatever place we entered. Now the game has to engineer scenarios in which the right things happen in the right place, and it can feel really unnatural at times. But anyway, we come back from Seraphite Island, though Yara couldn't come with us, and find Ellie's handiwork in the museum. Mel, Owen, and this dog dead. See, I told you I'd get this dog eventually. And with that, we're finally caught up to the confrontation in the theater between Abby and Ellie. But, uh, we're still going. After she pops Tommy in the brain, of course, you know, it's worth doing once and all that, what follows is a boss fight of sorts against Ellie, sneaking around the backstage to get the drop on her. This feels like a part of the game you might expect me to get in a stink about. Well, honestly, it's a nice little twist, and even though the fight can be annoyingly contextual at times, I thought it was a pretty cute sequence. I especially like how in the last phase you can see Ellie rummaging in her backpack to craft traps. That's a neat little detail, because that's what a player controlling Ellie would do. That aside though, the fight's nothing worth writing home about, just a rehash of the original game's David boss battle with less dramatic energy, and made insultingly easy with how you can just chuck a brick at Ellie's head to open up her defenses. So yeah, Abby wins the fight, beating the absolute tar out of Ellie. Dina materializes to try and save her, but if Ellie couldn't beat this chick- yeah, see, there it is. Abby nearly kills Dina, and Ellie cries out, She's pregnant. 
That doesn't stop Abby, who's all like, perfectly balanced. But at love's behest, Abby lets the two girls off with a very firm warning to never cross her path again. Then immediately after that, we're in a farmhouse as a perfectly healthy Ellie with a little baby boy nearby. Yep, that suddenly just roll with it. By walking around the house, we realize it's Ellie and Dina's farm, the exact kind of farm the two of them said they wanted to have earlier in the game. With how abrupt this transition is and how idyllic the farm is, I was pretty convinced this was all a dream sequence, especially when things turn nightmarish with visions of Joel's violent death cutting in. But it's not. It's real. It's happening. For a game that to this point is so eager to share its timetable, it's weird to me that we didn't get a one year later time card or whatever. I just found myself getting a bit lost in time during this later portion of the game, and everyone I've talked to about it seems to feel the same way. But maybe we're all just a little daft. So we walk out of the barn and there's a horse at the house? Is someone visited? Yo, what the heck? Is that Tommy? My boy taking a bullet to the back of the head like an absolute champ. So the living legend Tommy apparently has a lead on Abby and Lev being down in Santa Barbara. You know, because they're looking for the fireflies and all that. But makes it a point how he can't go after them because like, well, you know, he got shot in the head. But Ellie's got a pretty nice deal where she is. Loving girlfriend, happy baby, an absolutely ludicrous amount of sheep. So naturally, she's not interested, which makes Tommy say a bunch of mean things to her, yelling at her that she promised, hinting that she's a coward, all that. What follows is one of the most irritatingly unnecessary sequences in the entire game. It's in the middle of the night, we walk downstairs, play that stupid guitar mini game, and get another flashback. This one about the barn dance directly preceding the game's introduction. The scene that acted as a trailer in which Ellie and Dina dance and Joel pushes Seth for being a prat and Ellie mouths off Joel for the prat pushing. All the things we heard about and saw the consequences of in one of the very first scenes. Out of all the scenes in the game, this one, to me, feels the most out of order. Like, why here? Because of Joel standing up for her? You couldn't come up with a new scene for that or something? Or call back to the first game somehow? Unless that's not the point, but it's even more pointless if it's not. She got the girl, we know this. Wouldn't this scene be better placed in the beginning of the four years later scene? We see how Ellie's acclimated to the social spheres in Jackson, see how she met Dina in the prior scene in which she and Joel are cool, we get a little twist that that's not the case anymore. And then we see the aftermath the next day, and the little actions like the steak sandwiches actually mean something. Of course, it wouldn't make the opening even longer and more unwieldy, but at least then we'd immediately see coherence the game very quickly establishes it doesn't have much of. I guess it occurred to me right now as I'm recording this that it could be because this is the first half of a scene we'll talk about later. Regardless of anything, surprising absolutely no one, Ellie decides to indeed travel down to Santa Barbara to confront Abby and finally lay her anger to rest, leaving Dina and baby JJ behind. His vengeance eats you up, yo. Santa Barbara is the de facto final level of The Last of Us Part Two, and is roughly divided into halves, one for each character. The chapter starts with Abby and Lev finding an abandoned Firefly outpost and leaving to establish contact with the Firefly reunion Owen was sure existed. Turns out it's all chicanery! A ruse! And it's really a bang of get. That's it really bad. It's really a gang of bandits called Rattlers looking to add more prisoners to their collection they have that makes their balls feel bigger. I don't know, just go with it, I guess. We then switch back to Ellie cutting through a few neighborhoods worth of Rattlers before storming their home base and slaughtering even more. Seriously, it's a lot. Big fight. When she finds the cells and more or less whoopsies a prisoner riot, Abby and Lev aren't there. Turns out Abby tried to escape some time ago and her punishment was to be hung out on these here sticks with Lev left to die. And though Abby cuts them down and seems ready to let them go off on their own, she decides she's come too far to back down and has one last fight to the death with Abby. This time, it's Ellie who comes out on top. You think she's really gonna do it, gonna drown Abby in the ocean, but no. A memory of good old Joel flashes by. Ellie relents and lets Abby go free. The game ends with Ellie returning to the farmhouse, which has fallen into disuse and disrepair. We get one final flashback to the immediate aftermath of the barn dance, the second half of that scene I was talking about, in which Ellie admits to Joel that she feels no sense of purpose anymore and would like to learn to forgive him for saving her. I guess to retroactively make his death that happened 20 hours ago more tragic. The game ends with Ellie walking away from the house, nothing left, not even vengeance. First off, let me say that Santa Barbara in no way feels like a final level. A completely new setting, fighting against a completely new set of enemies, there's absolutely no dramatic tension to make this level feel like the story coming to a close. And abruptly transitioning to the dramatic final confrontation only throws into sharper relief what we just did to get there, i.e. kill a bunch of people, as well as, you know, the hundreds more we killed throughout the game just to throw it away at the final hurdle. See, I wasn't surprised at Ellie's decision, given how obviously the game was telegraphing its theme of revenge bad, cycle of violence and all that, but it doesn't make it not an anticlimax. It makes the violence and hardship we've soldiered through to get to that point feel cheapened, and ultimately feels like Abby just gets a free ride. 
Neil Druckmann has called Abby's plot a redemption arc, but the thing is, Abby never once admits the slightest bit of compunction for what she did to Joel. She basically forgets all about Jackson after leaving, despite it being the foundation the game immediately lays for her character. She got her revenge and doesn't feel the slightest bit sorry up through the very end. Trying to redeem her through the Seraphite kids she helps doesn't work, partly because how disconnected it is from killing Joel, you know, the reason you have to redeem her in the first place, but also because it doesn't really feel like Abby undergoes any transformation from that plotline. The kids saved her life, so if anything, she's just evening the score. She does go out of her way to head back to the trailer park to ensure they're okay, but she knows fully well what bad shape Yara was in, and she didn't really save them all that well. Given how we've seen this character operate up to this point, what with traveling almost a thousand miles to kill the dad that killed hers, I'm not convinced that Abby's not just going back to maintain that streak of keeping things even. She gets her revenge and ultimately gets away with it. She learns nothing. How has she redeemed herself? She hasn't. She doesn't care. I kept waiting for her to confront what she did, to realize she did to Ellie what Joel did to her, to feel some empathy, to feel some regret, but she never does. The sympathy the game tries to create for her character is for something completely different to what she did to need a redemption arc in the first place. I've heard it said online that this ending is the true tragedy of The Last of Us Part 2. If Ellie had just stayed home with her new family, Abby would have been left for dead on those sticks. But since Ellie let herself become consumed by vengeance, she ended up losing everything. And I can't actually see how that works. I guess the problem I have with it is that either way, this confrontation feels like it's rooted in Ellie's story, not Abby's. Because Abby's story becomes essentially an entirely different story. Taking Abby's arc with Lev as an individual story, it's about looking for an identity. And that story feels completely disregarded to make way for Ellie's choice about pursuing vengeance. And all that turns Abby into is a prop. A prop for another character in what feels like another story. I understand a story like this isn't interested in clear right and wrong answers, and I fully believe the intent was to create a climax in which one of these characters has to lose. It's just that the way the story is told up through the ending muddles how we're supposed to feel about either character, and ultimately makes it seem like both of them should lose. Honestly, I keep imagining what the ending might have been like if Ellie had gone through with killing Abby. There would have been this real pathos, this tragedy of her realizing how she doesn't feel any better, and she returns to an empty home, the price she had to pay that simply wasn't worth it. And then Abby's story would close with this sobering reminder that you can't escape from the violence in your past. But still, her and Lev's deaths would feel as an abrupt an end to their stories as it was to Joel's, being such a negative ending for what is otherwise a hopeful story about fighting for identity. Someone has to lose, which is an awkward position to be in when the point of your story boils down to the right way to deal with hate. Grayness doesn't fit well in an area like that. But even if it's not that, instead of making a direct point, the story just acts as some nebulous meditation on grief manifesting in violence or trauma in general, then what's the point? Why does this story have to be told? Yeah, the cycle only stops if you choose to stop, and the trauma won't fully heal either way, but you've given both characters the same trauma and trivialized it for each of them in every way. You can't just walk away and expect the pieces to fall in by themselves. Sure, maybe Abby was more justified in her vengeance than Ellie, so she gets off with less marks. After all, Joel killed most of a militia while Abby just killed him. But then why hinge her survival on Ellie continuing the cycle of violence just long enough to save her? Why not make a point about lasting trauma using the character that continued the cycle through the end? Why try to spin a horrified realization ending when you just spent 20 hours making us realize horrifiedly? Tragedy for the sake of tragedy isn't insightful in any way. The story of The Last of Us Part 2 feels confused that it knows what it wants to say, but ends up saying it in the most awkward, stilted way possible. It leaves the whole story feeling cold and not in any profound sense of the word. As important as it is to consider The Last of Us Part II on its own merits as an individual story, I think it's equally important to judge it as a sequel to The Last of Us, how it builds and comments on the thematic content of the original story. I'll remind you that this game does label itself as a Part 2, implying it's meant to expand upon the first story and all the points it tries to make. The original Last of Us was a picaresque journey through several locations that saw the main characters mutually grow and react to each new situation in a way that probed at the boundaries of their relationship. The Last of Us Part 2 is more focused in that sense. You are right where you need to be at all times, reacting to just murder. The way the characters interact doesn't serve as much in terms of greater meaning and themes of the story, instead just to service their deaths being tragic. The Last of Us is a depressing story with a message. The Last of Us Part 2 is a depressing story that downplays its message in order to come off as more depressing. In a very basic continuity sense, it does extend the story, with Joel's actions in the last game directly catalyzing the events of this new one. But it doesn't feel like any of those actions from the original game are re-examined here. Joel's actions against the world aren't treated any differently through this cycle of violence-revenge lens. 
This might be deliberate. Joel's choices are old hat, and now Ellie is forced to make her own in the world left behind. It just doesn't feel like a world re-examining itself or its use of violence, making a point that doesn't feel like a natural evolution of the originals. The idea of revenge and the cycle of violence isn't too far off from the kind of things we see in The Last of Us, but part two not re-examining what came before feels short-sighted, with both deaths that prompt each character's revenge feeling more manipulative than emotional. Meanwhile, Abby's arc involving Lev puts out the same airs as Joel's from the previous game, in trying to redeem slash justify a generally not great person's actions through parentage slash love for a child, but misses the point fairly dramatically, in that implicitly adopting the child neither develops Abby's character nor holds any deeper meaning unto itself. Her helping this one kid out of an obviously rough situation lacks the impact and importance of Joel's moral hot take that his surrogate daughter is worth more than the world. That radiates outward into something greater for its story and dramatizes and darkens the truth that a parent will go to any length for their child. Abby helping Lev doesn't justify anything she's done and is just there to make up for her golf clubbing an old man to death, so when Ellie hunts her down it's not a clean cut call to kill her. So, yeah, complete misfire there. But it's part two's use of the story's world and its violence that, to me, seals this game's fate. The game's intimate storytelling clashes against the dehumanizing violence of the gameplay. Bad guys are bad, kill away! This comes back to the big issue I mentioned having with The Last of Us near the start of the video, in that the game doesn't focus all that hard on the violence we create through gameplay, instead just the violence shown through cutscenes. But when it counts, The Last of Us gets it right especially at the ending with Joel's fight through the hospital. It's rooted in actual gameplay and what the player does rather than what they're shown, giving the ending so much dramatic charge by making the player feel particularly responsible. Part 2, however, is all show but no do. While it's possible to ghost through most encounters without harming a soul, there are several instances that outright force you into combat, and the game doesn't make anything of it. Kill everyone, kill no one, it's all the same when the story only cares about the ones you have to mash square to kill in a cutscene. This leads to plot events like Ellie carving through hundreds of human beings only to not carry out the final kill, feeling wholly dissatisfying. It ignores the interaction the player has had with the game up to then. And if that's the point, to be dissatisfying for thematic reasons, then why bring me into this at all? What did me playing the game matter as opposed to just watching all the cutscenes straight through and then going to bed? The fact that The Last of Us Part 2 is playable at all only hurts its story. Very rarely does the story actually get told through gameplay when in the first game, the player's involvement only heightened the artistry of the crucial plot points. The seeds for something similar are planted in The Last of Us Part II, but nothing ever grows out of them. Though come to think of it, those seeds might have actually been salt. As a sequel, I'm hard-pressed to think of any way The Last of Us 2's narrative expands or improves upon the original. I can remember several key moments of The Last of Us' story. The incredible opening, the gut-churning murder of David, the well-directed ending, bringing it all home. All I'm going to remember in The Last of Us Part 2 is how confused it was, how it stopped itself halfway through to try again. The beginning lacks impact, the ending lacks impact, and everything between feels like it's solely there to explain why there should have been an impact. And compared to the original's tight focus and constant momentum, it's just plain worse in every way. The Last of Us ends on an ultimatum. It can't be for nothing. The Last of Us Part 2 ends. It was all for nothing. This video I've really leaned into the story of The Last of Us Part 2 since that's what the entire game is very pointedly designed around, and that's where all the discourse is, but I don't want to completely ignore the gameplay, <laughs> unlike the game itself. So let's take a look at how The Last of Us Part 2 evolves the tense, stealthy gameplay of the original title. Well, they added a jump button. Finally, we've caught up to the Naughty Dog of 1996, but seriously, you can jump up ledges and over low cover to quickly navigate the environments. Finally, we've caught up to the Naughty Dog of 2016. Alright, I'll stop that now. There's low grass to crouch through to lower your visibility, and the option to go prone to hide an even lower grass and sneaky snake your way into trucks and low gaps. All stuff to make movement feel more natural in the world and generally less contextual. There's also ropes to climb up. Occasionally sweet okay, yeah, it's boring and basically contextual, who cares? I guess the problem I have with the gameplay of The Last of Us Part 2 is how I felt like I was approaching combat encounters the same exact way every time. And this includes encounters from the first game. I mentioned this in the opening, but most enemy encounters of The Last of Us were pointedly stealth-focused, requiring you to crouch and sneak your way around a somewhat open environment, picking off as many enemies as possible, before getting caught out and using what tools you've crafted from resources found in the environment to deal with the remainder. Basically, gameplay was divided between crouching around ruined buildings and opening all the drawers. In part 2, the environments are even more open, full of windows and cracks in the walls to break line of sight and reposition yourself. And with the new options for navigating these environments, things feel more organic in general. 
but I still never felt like they truly changed all that much about the nature of the encounters themselves, didn't really innovate anything. You don't actually use the new mechanics to do anything you couldn't already do in the first game. Climb up low ledges, mantle cover, it's emphasized more but functions identically to how it did before. Every encounter plays out the same, you start at one end, you go around the outskirts picking off who you can, ducking in and out of detection, assuming it isn't one of the many encounters that unavoidably drops you into the middle of open combat, pick off one, pick off the next, same old dance every time. Which isn't to say it's poor choreography. With the environment so open and so chock full of enemies, I was often sent scrabbling for my life, even when I began the encounter thinking I was overprepared. While the enemies can be pretty brutal, it's fairly quick and simple to slip in and out of detection, giving plenty of second chances but still taking pieces of your life each time. It's satisfying to roll in with a plan that works out, but it's just as thrilling to make it out by the skin of the broken mess that used to be your teeth. To that end though, I almost found it too easy to slip out of conflict. Plenty of times I'd be aiming a gun at an enemy I thought was coming to kill me, only for them to make the alerted sound. If I knew they'd lost me, I wouldn't have been so eager for attention. So it's a bit unclear at times where you stand with the enemies. Humans are more fun to fight with a greater range of behaviors like flanking, checking the spot you were last seen, and becoming more accurate if you run right at them, generally making them pretty fun to fight. They'll also call out one another's names when they die, a cute touch, but either sometimes the algorithm overseeing that has a whoopsie, or every dude in the Rattler base is named Wes. Fungus zombies are obviously a lot less interesting to fight. You sneak them, and then you fight them. That's it. Two new types of infected have been added, but neither are interesting. One of the new ones is a big gas bag thing that can't be stealth killed and throws clouds of spores to attack. I haven't heard that one before. And then there are the new infected that basically act like the ostrich things from Dead Space 2, and that they hide around and then ambush you. And I never felt like I understood if they automatically knew where I was or not. Either way, a lot of zombie fights will break out into melee brawls, which are basically QTEs now. Press dodge when we tell you to and square if we don't. I ended up taking away the dodge prompts because like, give me a challenge dude. Let me intuit based on the enemy's movements. Let me get my ass kicked. I should have also probably put on visual indicators for when the enemies notice you in stealth though. By default on moderate, a droning sound plays if you're spotted, but agnostic of enemy position and distance. Meaning it's the game telling you, hey, you're being spotted, and little else. At first I liked this, the sound randomly popping up to make me paranoid, almost make it a survival horror feel, but once I learned the best response was almost always to immediately go prone, it turned the game more silly than suspenseful, taking a dolphin dive every time I heard an iffy sound, so I'd say just bite the bullet. In fact, the game has a ton of accessibility and difficulty options to fine tune the experience, so give the menus a look. Might come off as obsessive or overboard, but I rather like the detailed effort. Hopefully we see more games like this. Less exciting is the game's tendency to lock what was standard feature in the first game behind upgrade trees. Is taking the smoke part out of the smoke bomb and giving it back later really progress? And the whole aim stability thing, now there are upgrades spread across supplement trees and weapons. I swear it's just trying to anger me specifically. But it's like I said, though killing the dogs, I mean completing the combat encounters can be fun, they get repetitive after long. The difficulty curve is more like a gentle slope, like real gentle, and an encounter in the final mission doesn't feel challenging in any way different from an encounter in any earlier mission. New environments keep things interesting, but it doesn't take more than an hour or two through the downtown level to get as full an understanding of the tools at your disposal as you'll ever need. So the hours and hours of other encounters feel like busy work between plot points? The attempts at variety aren't all that strong. You ride a horses a lot at the beginning, but like the first game lets you do that, you don't get any points for it here. You ride a boat for a bit through a flooded section of the city, but good lord is it bizarre to control. It turns super sharp. Best way I can describe it is when you stand on the back of a skateboard and like kinda like wiggle it around like this. It's, it's just weird. And then there's the stupid guitar minigame I keep passive aggressively mentioning. Hold the stick in the right direction, lovingly stroke the touchpad, boom, guitar. Can I just say I hate this? It's like if a movie paused itself and made you tap a sequence of random buttons on the remote to unpause it. So the people who make YouTube videos finagling the mechanic to play whole songs, more power to you. Glad you enjoy it, but as someone who has no interest in doing that, it just filled space that didn't need filling. And uh, this minigame is the last player action you perform in the entire game. First game it was walking with Joel towards a new life, here it's widdly widdly wee! Filling space that didn't need filling might as well be the mantra for The Last of Us Part 2, both in the story and the gameplay. By far the greatest enemy to the game is its sheer length, which I keep mentioning for good reason. It deteriorates every otherwise exciting aspect. There is just so much non-gameplay going on, in which you are technically in control but can do nothing of substance beyond holding forward to continue, and it makes the game a drag to get through. 
I know The Last of Us was kind of this poster child for the slowly walk forward and have an NPC chat at you model, and yeah, it was annoying back then too. At least it paced itself to keep the moments like those at the front of the level, let you soak in the sights and understand the environments before ramping up the urgency. Not so much in the middle of the chapter, not in what feels like every waking moment. So much game time is spent slowly walking after an NPC, or waiting behind them for them to climb a rope or a ladder. It just becomes nothing short of agonizing, and it just keeps happening. Walk here, walk there, walk after me, to the point where it feels like more of the primary gameplay loop than the actual gameplay. There's so much needless padding spread throughout this game. In Abby's story, this bit of highway breaks out from under her beefy arms, forcing us to climb through a boat full of fungus zombies, and then we just pop out where we otherwise would have been in the first place. The boss fight with the ugly amalgam infected thing, ooh, scary big monster, pretty memorable, right? But then it ends, and we gotta chase a part of him that broke off, we gotta like, crawl through the vents after it for a little bit, and then we just kill it too. It's the same as an enemy we've been fighting for most of the game, only this one has way more health. Does this... is this accomplishment? Is this boss fight better now? What about this plank of wood you have to pick up and drop to get across this highway? See, things like this sound petty, but in a game as long as this that keeps throttling the level of control you have, all these little impositions add up and seem more and more like interruptions. The game feels solely like following instructions, go here, walk here, talk to this person. Even the organic aspects of the gameplay feel like gimmicks, and the game being as irresponsibly long as it is quickly stales the experience. I was exhausted by the seventh hour, and hearing that seven hours is, on average, about a third of the way through the game was some of the worst news I had gotten in a long time. It's partly why I don't recommend exploring much of Seattle at first. The tedium will set in even quicker. The frustrations with the terrible narrative and repetitive gameplay are made all the worse just because of how obsessively polished everything else is in terms of presentation. The sound design of the game is immaculate and makes brutal moments even more sickening, and the voice acting is basically perfect all around. And the environments are rendered with incredible fidelity and detail, though I will admit that I got a bit bored with Seattle after long seeing what I felt like were the same sights again and again of overgrown ruins, especially when the first game had such greater locational variety. There are some truly aesthetically pleasing moments like the eerie red glow in the subway and Ellie story and the impossible dark torch lit escape through the woods and abbeys, but moments like these feel more fleeting than anything. But that doesn't negate the amount of detail put into the world and game. It just sucks so much to see this level of craft and care be put into what is ultimately a vapid, needlessly indulgent mess of a product. I suppose the ultimate question to circle back to is that if The Last of Us Part 2 was indeed the pretentious, uncomplicated experience I pinned it for based on the whole dog thing, well... Pretty much, yeah. Get this, I arrowed this dog, then I killed its owner, like, three feet away, and when someone found both of them dead, they cry out in a horror that, OH GOSH, SOMEONE KILLED THE DOG! The Last of Us Part 2 experience, everyone. I wouldn't call The Last of Us Part 2 a bad game. The attention to detail and the presentation is way too strong, and the gameplay offers up enough organic jolts of suspense. The crippling problem with The Last of Us Part 2 is that the story is terrible, and unfortunately the game is designed around the story, which, you know, might be a bit of a problem when you get right down to it, and I can never dream of calling it good as a result. I cannot for the life of me understand why they chose to lead with Ellie's story. Like, imagine if we opened on Abby's story instead. We get familiar with a new gang, get to learn more about them, get invested, so their later deaths actually feel like they mean something. Bit by bit, we get the sense that someone outside the WLF Seraphite conflict is hunting your friend circle down one by one. Maybe seeing Tommy at the marina cues us in that the old cast is still around and playing a role before we confront them and then we find Ellie. Maybe make it a bit of a twist reveal that the reason for all the killing is because Abby and her friends killed Joel, really challenging how we view the characters, Ellie included. Maybe it wouldn't be a great story, but it would at least offer some through line of intrigue the game we got simply does not have. The game we got doesn't feel sure of what it wants to show us, so it just shows us everything it can think up, but in the wrong order. And even if it was in order, perhaps not even the right things in the first place. As a sequel, The Last of Us Part II shortchanges and underserves every narrative aspect of the original, and the new additions to gameplay don't do much to make the overall experience anything all that different to what we had before. On its own merits, it's an irresponsibly long, horribly paced story that lacks basic understanding of investment in plot and character, with gameplay that rapidly becomes stale and routine. A shell of pretty scenery and visceral violence is not enough to salvage a hollow interior, and The Last of Us Part II is one of the emptiest games I have ever played. Let me just remind you that this analysis is coming from someone who thought The Last of Us was just okay and had room for improvement. I'm not some starry-eyed worshipper of the original, bitter we didn't get another masterpiece or anything, and I'm not some finger-steepling spite monger hoping and praying Part 2 would fail. 
I wanted to be proven wrong. I would have liked nothing more than to be swept up in a powerful emotional story, glued to my seat by every moment of tense gameplay. But man, is this not it. If there does end up being a Last of Us Part 3, I hope that Naughty Dog approaches things with the will to make more drastic and impactful changes, to make a story that feels like it means something more than cheap shock value and excessive grit. But until that change comes, I hope we've seen the last of this series. Thank you.